to the Podcast Evolved Book Club. I am your host, Aaron, and with me this week, we've got Krista. Hi. We've got a David. Hello, everybody. And we are covering Halo Renegades. Yay! Yep, we are Get completely hyped. on time. We are organized. This is the most recent piece of lore I think we have. The best piece of lore. This is the newest. Freshest. That makes it the best. Steaming hot. We'll be run through some of the details because this is a kind of big book to sink our teeth into. Oh yes, it is. Lots of spoilers. <laughs> oh yes, we're gonna we'll we'll warn you Ridiculous before we get spoilers. into this. There's a lot of things to cover. Uh, so first up, like we said, it's Halo Renegades. The author is Kelly Gay. You rem- may remember her from last book club. She also wrote Smoke and Shadow. Uh, the publisher Simon and Schuster. It's available in print, ebook, and audiobook. It was released the 19th of February, 2019. So about a month ago. It is 337 pages long, depending on your font size on Kindle. And who wants to read the summary? Because I'm the host and I get to delegate. Fine, I'll do it. Yay. (laughs) Find, claim, profit. In a post-covenant war, galaxy littered with scrap is the salvager's motto. And reinforge... I'm saying Reen. I still read this whole book as Reen anyway. Ryan Forge certainly made her mark on the trade. As she, all she wanted was to grow in her business and continue the search for her long-lost father. But the recent discovery of a foreigner debris field at the edge of human-occupied space has now put her squarely in the crosshairs of the Office of Naval Intelligence and the violent remains of the Covenant. Each faction has desire to lay claim on the spoils of ancient technology, whatever the cost. Sending Ryan and her crew, the Ace of Spades, on a perilous venture one that unexpectedly leads them straight into danger far greater than anything they've ever encountered. Dot, dot, dot. Ooh, spooky. So, the last couple of details to give you before we get into this. This takes place in 2557. It is... Oh, someone updated this. It is ten weeks after the events of Smoke and Shadow. I just put several in because I couldn't be bothered going back to listen for the exact number. And we're going to run through a list of things that uh, you might want to read before this. um... Also spoilers for these books as well. Yes, one of them is the most major spoiler possible. Uh, The others just mention a lot of the other lore. So, the Forerunner trilogy, specifically Primordium. You would definitely want to have read at least Cryptum and Primordium. Because there's a big old plot twist in Primordium that features heavily in this. Uh, Hunters in the Dark would also be relevant. Last Light and Retribution would be kind of relevant. Fake knowledge of Kilo 5 probably wouldn't hurt, along with the events and legacy of Onyx, but they're not they're not too major, but they drop names and places that won't mean anything to you if you haven't seen read the books. It'll just give you a bigger appreciation for some of the stuff in the book. Primordium's the only thing that's a definite big old spoiler you'd want to know, and I think Hunters in the Dark because it makes a little more sense. Like with Halo Wars, you want to read Hunters in the Dark to figure out how people got to the Ark, because then that makes a lot of sense. And I believe we were also saying before the show... Uh, a quick refresh on what happened in Spartan Ops probably wouldn't go amiss. Yeah. Is that it? Have we covered everything that might be relevant? I think so. I mean, just having a good knowledge of the Halo universe is very, very important during this book. She does a very good job at kind of explaining stuff in one sentence, but it helps to have a context to everything. You could read this as your first Halo book, but you would be a little lost. Yeah, I think you'd be a bit lost, and it wouldn't be until later that a lot of names would make sense. Also, I think it's safe to say that Kelly Gay might be a Halo fan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she had a lot of... She had to have a lot of knowledge. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Sorry, they touch on random things that you wouldn't expect, like the loot crates, and which is interesting because we've yet... We've always kind of kind of complained a little bit or criticized that the, Halo, the daily drops and the loot crates didn't really have any impact. And now we're seeing some thing being connected to them which is interesting um and that and like nightfall still kind of plays a very small part to play um, True, because there's a similar character he's in it very briefly but kip and he had the whole cedra terrorist attack yeah i think we we said this on the last book club i, I don't think anyone could pull off this number of references if they didn't have some sort of investment in the lore to begin with or she had to read a lot of the halo bible 
Also, sure. Smoke and Shadow, of course, read this, read that before Renegades. Yes, uh, this will be very confusing if you haven't read Smoke and Shadow first. So, will we dip into this? Yeah, let's uh, let's kind of wade into the waters of the very deep lore. <laughs> yes, we'll cover this in kind of big chunks, and we will uh, stop and talk where appropriate. So, I think the first thing before, just as this book starts, there is a small, short, like chapter from an unidentified person on a crashed ship on a planet with no atmosphere they're a robot of some description or mechanical of some description from the way he talks and he's a uh, he's dragging dead bodies and talking about himself and it's all a little vague and you can't work out what's happening oh it's super supposed to i imagine get you thinking that it's the crew of the ace of spades Yes. And that, because it's the same number of people, I think is it five, five bodies? Maybe four. Yeah, I think it mentions, though, that the others died on impact. Yeah, which kind of makes you think, oh man, does like, is this the S of Spades? Is this like some, and then it, it immediately cuts back to whatever happened before. Yeah, I must admit that was my first thought when I read this was, oh my god, little bit has killed everyone. That's what I was thinking, <laughs> like, did you just kill everybody? This would be the first uh, Halo book to kill all of the characters from the book before and then write a whole new book and new characters. <laughs> <laughs> so like you said, it it jumps out of that, it leaves you wondering, and then it dives back into life with uh, Ryan and the crew of the Ace of Spades. And they're in the middle of a heist. Yeah, I'd say a heist. They've begun their revenge plot against Gek. Which I think is awesome. For killing Cade. So they've, uh, they're they repairing... Oh, they do mention at the start they've had to go and repair the Ace of Spades because if you remember at the end of Smoke and Shadow, uh, Little Bit offers to soup up the slip space drive and get them back to <laughs> Venezia really quickly, except Little Bit fries the slip space drive in the process. He immediately breaks shit, yep. Yes, he, he didn't account for human technology not being able to keep up with the, the Forerunner systems. He fries the drive, and then uh, Ryan has to get the Ace of Spades towed to the planet of... I have it here somewhere. Uh, it's the outpost of Kamoya on a moon of... Uh, Vita... Vita... Le- Ye- Yevna? Yeah. It's a thing. <laughs> Starts with a V. Beautiful. I think it's in the Sordova system, this is, so that'll do. But it's this, uh, like... Outer Planets Outpost. It, uh, it, I love the way they describe the system where the city is a load of colony ships that were landed on the planet and built around. Oh, it sounds awesome. Such a cool setting. Yeah, because they're, they're going to an auction which is on a, like a banking vessel that was landed on the planet and it's the state of the art security and weapons and, uh, everything else. They talk about how, like, the planet's pretty safe because all these ships still have, like, their defense turrets aimed at the sky so you really can't like fly in and cause any issues you've got to play by the rules they're going to they have this scheme in place where Gek has come to take part in this mysterious auction they don't know what he's come to buy yet and they have a plan where Ryan has got super tech now thanks to Nico and Littlebit she has a super special glove that can scan data pads and see what was on the screen previously. So she's going to get close to Gek, scan him and find out what he's up to and then like get revenge on him. And while he's at the auction, she has sent Nico off to rob the Luminary of his ship that he stole at the end of the uh, the last book. We have, a, we have a new crew member. You should mention that too. Oh, that's true. Ram has uh, decided to stay on the Spirit of, or the spirit of Fire. He has decided to stay on the Ace of Spades. So he is now the new kid, the new second in command. Pretty much the old man, the old man of the crew. I think they say at one point he's pumped full of like bioengineering nano- nanites that are repairing him. So he's like still not 100%, but he's the, he's the new old guy. Also, we should probably mention that in between the other book and this one, Kip got found out by a little bit. And he has oh, been yeah. thrown off the ship. It was mentioned at the very end. He ran away. So he, he's he's gone now. Uh, he's away back to Oni and we have Ram in his place. So they go to this auction, which is run by the Yanhet. 
Yeah, I was glad to see these back. It's really interesting because they were just kind of in Nightfall. Just They were just kind of there. So it's nice to see them in other stuff. Yeah, I like to see that the the not what what do they call them something races like the subservient race or something they're not yeah. uh, they're not like a member race but they're servant like race it's it's the only non covenant alien race we've ever had apart from the flood and the forerunners so yeah it, but it's good to know there's other races out there just in smaller quantities that they weren't really part of the covenant but were like slaves to them in one form or another so we have the yeah. yonet which are like um what do they kind of describe them as um I don't really know they've got a weird Slave way about labor. them. Yeah, kind of like that. They describe them as having like a very sort of submissive demeanor, but then Ryan says that they use that to their advantage a lot, that people like don't oh, assume the they're as devious and maybe as conniving as they actually are. So they're playing on the stereotype that they're a bit submissive and uh, all the rest of it. Also, they look like something right out of Star Trek. They do. They look very <laughs> like the Remans. That's the thing I thought. Yeah. Shout out to Star Trek Nemesis, the sad Star Trek movie. But we don't talk about that one. It's only good for the scene where the ships crash. That that is the only bit that it's good for. <laughs> Stop watching it there. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, back to this. So we go to the auction. When Ryan uh, Ryan wasn't invited to the auction, she uses what's left of her money after a pair of the apes of spades her and Ram put all their money into like one bank account. So when the auctioneer runs a credit check, she seems like she still has cash, which I like. I wouldn't have thought of that. And then Oni will find a trace of where she is based on the credit check, which I also never thought of, which is cool. So she works her way into the auction, and when she gets in there, Gek sees her. Gek tries to strangle her, but the auction rules are no violence in the auction house. So he's forced to not kill her by the auctioneer. Which I think was, it was a cool scene. It is, yeah. All these lasers are on him and he still has uh, Ryan by the throat up in the air and she's about to pass out and they still won't let her go. But he he eventually is forced to. So Ryan has managed in the middle of this to scan his uh, like forearm computer and then she watches the auction and finds out that they're there to bid on a harvester. Which you rem- may remember from, I believe, Spark video Nuts games as- and... Escalation. I believe it was there were harvesters mentioned in both of those. And Halo 5. Where it is an incredible level where you fight on one. The octopus thing? Yeah. That's a well, harvester. that's not a harvester. What's... No, that's not a harvester. That's an what's octopus. That? Yeah, it's a different one. Oh, right. Okay, sorry. Harvester looks more like a big tick. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was a harvester. Obviously not. So, that's what the auction is for. Uh, Gek eventually wins it, although he almost has, like, uh, fisticuffs with some brutes that were there to buy it. And some humans as well. I dread to think what the insurrection would have done with a harvester, but... (laughs) They were obviously there to shop big anyway. So, this is uh, how Rian... I keep going to call her Rian too. Ryan. Ryan escapes. Gek has to pay for his booty, so... Uh, Ryan make, cho- uses the opportunity to run. She's on her way back to the Ace of Spades. She tries to radio Nico, and then she gets sack over the head and kidnapped. Boo! Yep, when she eventually gets the sack off her head, she's greeted by, a, I think she describes him as a giant, but she can yeah. tell immediately Big that he's guy. only. Yep, she's in the back of a pelican. There's a guy in black and a mask. He's kidnapped her, and then a woman appears, and she's got Nico and... Suddenly they realize they've been caught uh, and only have taken the... The ace? No, well, they've the taken the ace as well. The luminary, that's the word I was thinking of. So they got the luminary that they tried to steal and they got them. And then she tells these two giant people about Gek. So they go off to get Gek and they send them up to the ship in orbit. The Turcanado? Turacado? Turacado, I think, yeah, they pronounce it in the, in the audiobook. So they're sent up there where we meet the infamous Agent Han, who was only mentioned in name in the last book. So he's like the Oni guy that works this area looking for Forerunner relics. There's uh, a lot of back and forth in this. During this time, Ryan works out that the big people are Spartans. She figures that out very quickly. Uh, I think we knew that anyway. Yeah, we had a fairly good idea. Anytime someone's seven foot tall in Halo, they got to be a Spartan. When they were, even when they made the very first comment where he picked her up like a doll and just ran with her without making any kind of effort whatsoever, I'm like, yeah, okay, a Spartan grabbed you. Do you know what I mean? It's it's the only 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 real choice. 
the whole long and short of this whole process is Han's a bit of a dick. Han threatens Ryan. He goes a bit too far and confiscates all of her assets, but he leaves her with the ship. It's a hard scene, really, because you have like her in, in been interrogated by Oni. You have the Spartan there. You have like her pretty. He he pretty much systematic, systematically breaks her down, and kind of like I'm literally taking everything you hold dear. Tough shit. Oh, and she is ticked off too. Oh yeah, it's a great scene where she punches him. She gets around the Spartan and punches and him she, right in the face, like knocks him out completely because he just goes down, and that's that. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. And like later she says about, I'm pretty sure the big guy could have stopped me, but y- you can tell during this process when it happens, the big guy's not impressed with the way Han's behaving. Not at all. Yeah. I think, is he introduced here yet? Do we know who he is? He gets introduced after they kick Ryan and that off the ship. They stick them back on the ace and send them on their merry way. And then there's like a conversation between uh, Han and our big Spartan's name is... Nova. Novak. I think all the Spartans have very cool last names lately. Well, they have last names. They're Spartan Fords because they're like normal people. They don't mean recruited into the Spartan program. Also, during this process, uh, Novak did not know that Ryan was looking for the Spirit of Fire because they say at one point she mentions the ship's name and she, she sees a reaction to Novak's eyes that he was clearly not on that need to know list. Yeah. They dump Ryan out, and Ryan decides to head back to Venezia to meet Sav Fell. Han and the only guys take a little bit, and they get the information out of them for the debris field, because that's what they want. Ryan and the crew head on to meet Sav. On the way there, they manage to decode some of the information they copied, because Ryan also used her magic glove. That was a cool moment. Yeah. Does she use it on Han, or does she use it she on... She did, yeah. Yeah. Big guy. It was either Han or the big guy, I can't remember which, uh, on Novik, but she pretty much scans Oni's computers and has, like, gleans the, uh, a random location of, uh, like, a distress cut. It turns out that the Turricado have been, like, requested by Oni to go and respond to a distress call. And we don't know what it is, but they're just to go and secure the area. And I believe it references... They say the Rubicon, don't they? I No, I don't think they say the Rubicon here. They just say a distress call to do with the 2554 incident. Yeah, I think a year is mentioned. That Ryan I don't think they mention the name. We don't get the name until later when Ryan and that get to there. But then they're going off to do that. And the reason Ryan goes back to Fell is because... She knows she's bug- they're bugged and the ship's bugged. So they use Fell and her paranoid security to find all the bugs. Which gets into really weird territory because it turns out Oni inject you with bugs when you don't know about it. That was creepy as all hell. Yep, yeah, that was the bit I didn't like. Uh, the bugs in the skin and all the rest and the bugs in the ship was one thing. But bugs that they stick in your arms. And like Ryan says, she tried to remember back to any point where she felt like a prick. But she couldn't remember any of it. But... She put that down to, like, her emotions being high, but it seems like they just, like, got her. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I don't like that. Bad Oni, bad Oni. Oni, you're definitely the bad guys in this story. Yeah, I mean, also we should point out that uh, that fire team, that's fire team Apollo, the Spartan Force, and we haven't seen Apollo in, from anywhere other than the loot crates, so that was kind of interesting to see we get actual Spartans named. Because as in the loot crate, you are kind of role-playing as a Spartan part of Apollo to, when reading this and you're doing an investigation into Cortana and her kind of breakdown over the course of Halo 4 and onwards. So it's interesting to see actual Spartans named from that team doing something and you get the impression that they were pulled from something to come into this mission post there before the Rubicon kind of distress signal goes out. So that's cool to see there. They're building on that a little bit. And these Spartans play throughout the throughout the book in a kind of cool way. So I like them. That was a good addition. We have that. Uh, what happens? The, the last thing that happens here is Ryan ends up owing Sav a favor because before Oni came and literally stole her entire warehouse and flew it off the surface of Venezia. <laughs> that is so freaking crazy. They just, just airlift an entire warehouse. <laughs> I just imagine the drop ships from the first Halo Wars coming in that drop the bases and just lifting the whole thing and flying away. Because they go to the site and it's j- literally just the uh, foundation. Yeah, I imagine kind of like the Wizard of Oz. You just arrive and the house is gone. 
They just used tornado technology. But lucky for them, Sav came first and had a quick check through Ryan's warehouse before Oni lifted it and lifted a, what do they call it, a mining superintendent? Like a module? And it's worth a bit of money, so this is how, even though Ryan's assets are frozen, this is how they're able to fund their plan to go to the distress call and steal whatever Oni had. They cook up this plan and then the story switches back to mysterious robot person. Except he says his name. Yes, he very quickly starts to talk about who he is and immediately I went, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, no one's reading this book and then I had to run and talk to Ian because no one else was here. (laughs) It turns out mysterious robot man is Guilty Spark. Yay! Favourite. I was so happy. I was... (laughs) So I was reading this and um, Trent was in the other room and he just comes in. He's like, are, are you OK? I'm like, Guilty Spark is back. He's like, oh, OK. And then left. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it was great, though. It was a good moment for me. I've been waiting my whole life for this moment. Yeah, I had to message you guys straight away when I read it. It was like one in the morning or something. I was like, holy shit. Holy shit. I mean, I know I mentioned I know I mentioned messaged because uh, we have a chat with all of us in it. I messaged you. I messaged you guys and I'm like, oh my god, the best thing ever just happened in the book. And then I had to PM Aaron because you hadn't read that part yet. This is the problem I had when we were doing the Smoke and Shadow book club as you're all talking about this stuff. And I'm like, oh, just wait till you see the characters they bring into the next book. Because I really didn't expect this at all because I had so many grand theories about what Guilty Spark was up to. But I never once stopped to consider that he might drop into another one of the novels like this. You thought he'd have his own novel? I didn't know what he was going to do. I, I seriously, at one point, I was still hanging on him and the crew of the Rubicon becoming the TV show. Like, I really was convinced we'd end up going there with it. I mean, they still could do that. They would just get Tim Dadabo to reprise his role as Guilty Spark. Maybe, but now that they've confirmed the TV show's set during the Covenant War, it's not going to happen, so. Also, what a troll to put Guilty Spark on the cover <laughs> and everyone be like, oh my god, what is that? That's kind of weird. And then 343 is just like, oh, you have no idea, my friend. That's the first thing to say, like, the artwork for this, when that got released, that was a big reveal. And loads of people were talking about it. Everyone was hyped, like, what is it doing? Who is that? It was standing with an armager, like a soldier. Yeah, they got a little bit of body. Like, I assume that. I never once thought, you know, this might be Guilty Spark or someone different. I just thought, oh, yeah. look, they got a little bit of body and now you can do things. So the the long and short version of this section is Guilty Spark and the crew of the Rubicon had a minor technical issue. He crashed. They all died. But he managed to find a armature body that was in storage on the Rubicon from the Ark. It was partially damaged. It had a wonky leg. So he was able to transfer into this body and then he spent three years on the Rubicon crash site gathering his head and reassembling his thoughts and memories back together and he has now, he describes it, he says he has two re- distinct personality traits and I assume that's Guilty Spark and Chakas and then he ponders is he the third trait that like controls the two of them now? Is he just something new? Yes, is he like a new personality outright? For anyone who hasn't read the Greg Bear stories, the Rubicon of their ship is kind of where Primordium ends where the reveal that Guilty Spark 343 is still alive and that he was originally a human and like an ancient human whose brain he went on an adventure essentially and he was essentially copied and digitized and made into a monitor composed yeah and made into the monitor and then left behind and then all his memories were kind of carpermentalized and then I think you'd imagine with the thing that happened to the with the domain or I can't remember did they specify what happened after that he was he basically he became guilty spark and then when a certain marine sergeant shot him with a spartan laser a couple of times and then a certain master chief shot him a few more times it damaged him and then the compartmentalization started to break down and then the rubicon scooped up Ah, his remains they took it on board and they were interrogating it but then while they were interrogating it guilty spark basically broke out of the firewalls took over the ship and hijacked it Because the book ends with Guilty Spark's remains go dead and they're like, okay, we'll flush all this out the airlock. And then they have this dialogue where they're like, the engineers are really freaking out. I wonder what's going on outside. And then suddenly in the audiobook, it's this really fantastic section section where Chakas' voice changes to Guilty Spark voice because Tim Dadabu does the the narration for the book. 
That's real cool. You never put two and two together till near the end when they give him the guilty spark sound effects, and you're like, oh wow. That that's that's pretty cool. And basically, he's like, um, I know where the librarian is, and we're gonna go find her. They're going on a grand adventure, and he knocks the crew out, and off he goes and murders them. And that is it. And then they crash. Well, so accidentally murdered. Is it? Sixty-two percent his fault. That's yeah. mostly his fault. <laughs> they explain this later, so we'll carry on anyway. Uh, we then bounce from Guilty Spark on the planet to Earth. And we go to outside of Voy. This is the area that was featured in Hunters in the Dark. It's outside the portal generator. They have a, fa- a human facility there. And it's now run by Annabelle Richards, who is a character from Hunters in the Dark. And she runs a project called Bookworm. Oh, it's so cool. I love this project. I was really excited when I read this part. I'm like, oh my god. Bookworm is basically have designed an underground AI prison to trap Guilty Spark because after the events of the Rubicon they realise that Guilty Spark is far too dangerous to be out and about. I love the way they refer to him as the most dangerous being in the galaxy right now. I'm like, oh shit. Yeah, Gu- Guilty Spark is a is an ultimate threat. So they've designed this prison where they're going to like interrogate him and try to confirm the version of events he gave the crew of the Rubicon, which basically he... This is Primordium, the book. So he gave them this book, but there are some inconsistencies with it. But Project Bookworm also have access to the Born Stellar relation, which is Born Stellar's testimony to... What do we call them? Catalog. Catalog. Yeah, there's three of them in existence. Three catalogs. One went with the direct, one with the librarian, and one with I think there's more catalog, but they work in trios. I think that's what it is. The the juridicals, they're basically like the forerunner, like detective, policey, legal people. They take testimony, they record stuff, crimes against the mantle, all that sort of thing. And in um in the Forerunner trilogy, there's a catalog all the time. The catalog is always around the main characters, basically. At least in Cryptum and Silentium. There is one with the librarian on Earth, and that is the one that they've dug up for Project Bookworm. There was one on Requiem, I believe. I think so. That was fried because that one had the unfortunate mispleasure of having the domain give testimony. And the other one was with Born Stellar. Born Stellar. Yeah, so, and they escaped the galaxy. And they all share knowledge and stuff like that. So they have this anyway. So they have like some information. They basically, they know the Forerunner trilogy of books. They know what we know. It's so cool. I love how that the, the books are basically canon in the Halo universe as well. Yes, they are canon. They're also an in-universe item. So they have all this information. So they know quite a bit about the Forerunners, but... They want to use this and then they want to interrogate Guilty Spark because the ultimate goal for Oni and for Bookworm is to find, well, one, the librarian and two, the domain because Oni would really like access to the domain because that would give them a little bit of an advantage in the universe. Just just a little bit, just a tiny bit. Also interesting that they point out that, yep, they know who the precursors are and they know that the Forerunners didn't build the domain and they still want access to it. It's kind of crazy that the precursors are now kind of directly influencing what's happening present day Halo now. Without being the Flood? Yeah, yeah. Because we haven't heard about the precursors since the Forerunner trilogy. They haven't really been mentioned at all. It was kind of shocking to see the word precursor in a Halo book in 2557. It's like, oh shit. We bounce from that and we go back to Guilty Spark. Uh, This book, it's kind of like the last book. It's pretty tight, but we move about between a couple of key players all the time. So we go back to Ryan and the crew, and they have now arrived at uh, Garanos A, which is the final resting place of the Rubicon. They go down to have a look around. They find a transmitter. They find, uh, like, footprints on the planet in the dust. Is it a planet or a moon? This is a planet, isn't it? Sure. I think this is a planet. They find these traces, but they can't find any signs of life. They find graves for some of the crew. Uh, They also check the debris, and that's where they get the name Rubicon, but they don't know the significance of it. So we're not really... We don't know too much yet. And then while they're looking around inside the ship, they find what looks kind of like metallic-shaped chunks that make 
the shape of a robot on the ground, but they're inert. It's cool. They can't tell how they go apart. It just seemed like... Yeah, they're all just lying together. together like they belong together. So they gather it all up and they gather up whatever salvage they can. Like good salvagers they are. Yeah, they try to find a computer core, but they can't. But they take the other stuff back, including the pieces of robot, and they put them in the hold. And then I think they're doing one last sleep of the, sweep of the remains. And suddenly the pieces of robot come back to life because it turns out Guilty Spark just like mostly switched himself off, but he was listening the entire time. And once there's no one around, he gets up out of his like storage bin and hacks the Ace of Spades. And I think he describes it as a good little ship. Yeah, it's cool. He has like a, a good kind of learning moment where he kind of reconnects with the universe and like downloads everything about it and figures out the crew and where they came from and kind of analyzes everything and decides in the course of it. And he talks about how this crew are different to the last crew because they're more... They're civilian. Civilian, they're not soldiers. He also kind of found finds some similarities between his old crew, um, like a... Bornsteller and Riser. Riser and Venivra. Also he kills some Oni bugs. Yeah, he's kinda lonely, but he uh, yeah, he finds Oni bugs that Fell's equipment missed. Uh so he gets rid of those and then he goes and hides in the bin for another bit. And then when the crew are back on, he reveals himself and it's this cool little scene where Nico's sitting in the bay and he's like I feel like I'm being watched, but there can't be anyone here because no one's used the airlock. And then he grabs a pipe and turns around and it's a guilty spark standing behind him. Everyone else reappears and there's a like a long conversation with guilty spark, which is kind of cut short. A ship reappears in the system and it turns out it's the Turricado and they've come now to like secure the remains. But because guilty sparks hacked the Ace of Spades, he knows this. So he's able to get them away before they're caught. Well, he immediately makes modifications to the ship and has like um, pretty much takes it over and then slips space in the yeah, atmosphere. Yeah, he, he remote controls it and he uses that to get away. And like Ryan's not very happy that another Forerunner AI has taken over a ship. I think the last thing she says to him is, don't burn out my slip space drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then like he flies off. The Turricados see them leave, but they don't get a chance to like intervene. And then he tells them, that there's like more conversation with 343 and the crew and he tells them that he's taken them somewhere and that he he basically says like, you work with me, I work with you. And like, I need your help to do what I want to do and in return, I'll get you all the salvage you need. And he offers them this planet called Etrin Harbridge and he says there's four runner ships, there's equipment, there's everything you could possibly want. They go off to this planet and when they drop out of slip space where they're going to be there... Uh, the shit suddenly hits the fan because there's a couple of uh, Seraph fighters that like fly past the nose of the ship and then immediately Ryan realises they've flown back to the debris field. And she gets so mad. <laughs> because it turns out Etrin Harbridge is the name for the shield world. I think we said this in last week's episode but they don't actually reveal it till now. That was the name of the shield world. The crew of the Spirit of Fire blew up so they've flown back and they're like oh fuck. And then Nico like tries to say like oh well he couldn't have known that and no one's really having it yeah before they got here there was a brief moment of 343 kind of evolving where he realizes that he can't just take what he wants from the crew he needs to work with them so he says i won't be a prisoner but i won't hold you a prisoner too so like obviously uh, ryan's pretty pissed off that you pretty much did what you wanted anyway and took the ship and took us all prisoner and we can't do anything so there's like great moments where like he's obviously trying to come to terms with the changes he needs to make in his own kind of decision making and stuff like he's obviously keeping a lot from them and there's an element of like he talks about trust uh, with Ryan and kind of like how to be it earned and not given all that kind of stuff which I found really interesting he kind of acknowledges that Chakas was a thief and like he would have taken advantage of them but he's also this whole he's no longer really Chakas anymore so He's gonna try a different tactic. Yeah, it's cool. They eventually escape this. Uh, they escape the debri- the debris field again, but not before the UNSC show up and nuke the debris field, because they have decided acid denial is the way to go. They're they like they're escaping the the seraphs and they find them and they eventually get Lara rings them and starts laughing at them down the com, so she gets <laughs> really pissed off. So she kind of goes after them and realizes a covenant fleet protecting a harvester where they're obviously harvesting something, trying to get something from the debris field, and it's in that moment where 
the UNSC um, show up and start nuking everything straight away. And that kind of, so then she turns around and she starts laughing at him, which I thought was an awesome moment of just like the two of them just um, at each other's throats and just egging each other on, winding each other up. So Gick Lara has to, has to get out of town. Yep, everyone has to like get out and only for Guilty Spark, the Ace of Spades never would have made it because the, the like, the blast wave from the nuke hits them and almost knocks them into the portal, the slip space portal and the edge of it and would have vaporized them. But Guilty Spark manages to get them out in one piece, but all the crew passes out in the process. And then when they all come round again, he tells them that he's taking them somewhere different now. Ryan's kind of not having much of it at this stage, but he tells them he's taking them to another Forerunner world called uh, Trinial. He's taking them there because it also has the facilities he needs. He explains how he can enhance the Ace of Spades with Forerunner tech because occasionally when the Forerunners didn't have their own ships at their disposal, they could use like the local ships and enhance them. So he's going to do the same thing here. They call it like a seed, right? Uh, they have an upgrade seed, yes, because they have ship building seeds in Cryptum. They have a ship building seed that builds the ship at the start of the book that the Didact uses to leave Earth. It turns a mountain into a ship. And then oh, this yeah. is like an this is an upgrade seed where you put it in an existing ship, so we need one of those for the infinity someday. That would be really cool. I wonder how it would change the infinity. And I don't think he makes any, ch- he doesn't plan on making any changes to the outside because he basically says, I could take a forerunner ship, but it's not very inconspicuous, so I need this little ship instead. He also talks about getting them a slip space, oh, I forget the crystal? exact name of it, like a crystal, like a sliver of a crystal, which is how the forerunners have super duper engine tech. The crystal's really cool. It comes in later, but. It's amazing. I think they mention it in the Forerunner book somewhere where there's this one giant crystal and the Forerunners, there was one group of Forerunners that were in charge of like shaving the slivers off it and that's how the Forerunner drives They tell you that in this book. And the crystal like distorts space-time. Yeah, I think they mention it in Fractures because they also wanted crystal shards there in that story when they repair the domain. I think that's where that comes from. All right, okay. Uh, They're going to this planet anyway. I'm en route. Guilty Spark decides to get everyone on side by playing them the Primordium audiobook. Yay. He leaves them all in the <laughs> rec room with his like show and tell, and by the end of it, everyone's in tears and everyone feels very sympathetic for him, but Ryan doesn't trust him 100%, but Nico and Lesser are totally on side, and Ram seems not too swayed either way. What I find interesting about them listening to the to his uh, account of all the four events is how like shattering it is to them. Just a change in their entire history, everything they've ever known. And just how much of a shock it is. Because at one point he talks about humans and forerunners having a war together, and he goes like, humans didn't exist when the forerunners did. And he sort of breaks at them like, no, no, we did. They just, uh, and in a lot, some ways we were smarter than the forerunners. We were, we were more advanced in some ways than they were. We were so advanced that they basically, you know, ruined our entire race by, what was it called, like, de-evolution? Yeah, they de-evolved them back into the cavemen, so they have all this, and then they're kind of coming around to Guilty Spark, and they're feeling more sympathetic, and they're going to help him. So they get to Trinial, and this planet's interesting because it was a Forerunner planet that was in the path of the Flood, so all the Forerunner inhabitants decided to gas themselves with poison gas, rather than be eaten by the flood. Well, it's not just them, but like all life. They put a toxin to get rid of all life on their planet. So it was like supposed to be a husk, a dead planet. And that's why I assume then it's not damaged in any way because the flood weren't interested in it because it was dead. Yeah. When they arrive here, it's like overgrown and it's tropical and the tiny little birds have now turned into giant creatures the size of the Ace of Spades. And they, they do this like good description of how it is and it's overgrown and all the rest of it. But they fly down to this builder facility and then Guilty Spark designs them a new improved uh, Ace of Spades with the seed and they get the they get the slip space shard as well. They do all their enhancements. They loot a little bit. Yeah, they had a great scene where like um 
they're on this ghost planet and essentially like it's a tomb and then like they find the recording they find oh like, yeah four kind of um remains but they're just like they're just the suits of armor they're kind of like embracing or something yeah they're like holding hands and one of them's like embracing and then there's one that's like in front of a screen and they find the message yes yeah reen pushes a button and the message replays of him telling them what he did and um, 343 comes in and translates it and then plays it back again. So they find out, like, oh yeah, they set the toxin. They wiped out the entire, I think it's like 800 million something. They actually have the exact number that they mentioned, like young, old, everybody's wiped out. And just essentially they're powering everything down themselves, essentially. It's so haunting. And then the guys are just like, okay, we don't really want to loot and salvage this thing. And in the meantime, 343 is like, accessing all the kind of satellites and he was going to send out a message i'm not sure to who or why but he was essentially putting something out that would then bring everybody to this planet basically just putting a signal out there so it would eventually be found i think he was going to ping the same sort of system that all the other forerunner gear pings but this would have been like a new activation you know the way they said the it like add to the luminary or something right Okay, yeah, maybe that's what it would do. It would yeah. have added to the absolute record, because I think the absolute record was a recording of all Forerunner gear and tech and where it existed. But, like, Trinial wouldn't have been on the list, because as far as it was concerned, it was lost. So he would have, like, binged it back on, and it's basically turning its location back on with GPS again. And then anyone that had access would have been able to find it and figure out where they were eventually. Yeah, kind of like a monument to all your sins. That's just what I was about to say, yes. Did anyone get, like, a Bioshocky one vibe from this planet? Just, you know, the dead, like, finding the remains and just this emptiness? Kind of creepy? Nope. No? Okay. Never I played thought Bioshock, it was- <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, like, I think this would be a really cool place for a game. This dead planet? This dead planet, yeah. Just kind of exploring and finding more recordings like that, because I love stuff like that. I really liked this setting. I hope they do something more with it, but at the same time, the only people who know about it is the Ace of Spades crew now, so we'll see what happens. But I think they might use this planet again at in some point. It's a lot of technology to just be sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. We go from this to the next part of the plan, so you guys can work with me on this because this is around the time where I stopped my second audio listening, so I'm, I could start to get fuzzy and miss stuff. Basically... Ryan comes up with a new plan to get their shit back from Oni. And Guilty Spark's going to help them. And then in return, they're going to take Guilty Spark to Earth. And they're going to do his business. So her plan is to make counterfeit Guilty Spark. Uh, they, they make like this little storage unit with enough like fake programmed splintered Guilty Spark in it to seem like it might be the real thing. Enough to trick Oni into thinking it's real Guilty Spark. Before they do all this and make this plan, they go to a moon that's like their secret moon, their little spot, their retreat. So they go there and then cause 343 needed to repair the armature because the neural interface wasn't working right. So he repaired himself so that he could get access to more of his memories and more of everything that he was. And at the same time, they didn't upgrade the ship yet because Ryan didn't want it upgraded because she likes her ship, it's her home. So she was kind of really averse to the change. So when they're at that ship or on that moon, they reconnect to like their um, the comm system and they get loads of messages coming in. They get like notified of the crazy bounty that's on their heads by Geklar and the fact that Agent Han left him a message saying that he's trying to organize an exchange and give them all their stuff back for whatever they took from the planet. So that's kind of the big moment of like where the end, the third act of the book kind of tastes kicks off and you get the premise of okay agent han was talking to annabelle who was the bookworm um lead and then oh i was gonna say you get the impression when he talks that han is one mistake away from disappearing and like yeah joining other people in only black sites and never coming back because he's he's made a few mistakes so he reaches out to annabelle and he basically says to her I have some shit she wants. We can we can negotiate and get her in one place and we can still get Guilty Spark and we can win this. Yeah, I love that Annabelle pretty much like takes him down. I'm like, you fucked up. You took way too much for them. You should have made them your ally, not your enemy. I like totally laid into him and I, I thought it was pretty cool. 
that you can see like even only are like you all receptor mark. Do you know what I mean? They come up with this plan. They, they enhance the ace at this stage, don't they? Yes, they do. So we now have souped up ace, although we don't really get to hear too much about what it can do. But it now has super duper slip space drive, among other things. So they then go to have a meetup with Han and the Spartans from Apollo. And the plan is to meet in a nice public space, do the handover, and then everyone go their own ways, except they know fine rightly that it's not going to be that simple. And I think right, Reen has actually planned for it to go south, because that's what she wants. So she's engineered the situation so that it will all kick off in their favor. Well, in their favor more. Yes, and they can escape in the middle of it. I think everything's going to plan. They put Guilty Spark in, or fake Guilty Spark in this containment device that they're going to take him back to Project Bookworm with. There's the handover of the goods, and then who steps in and causes things to go south too soon. It's the bounty hunters, isn't it, that are on the hunt Yeah, all the bounty Ryan. hunters show up. Like, three different factions show up and start a... Start yeah, and then it becomes a four-way... F- yeah, it becomes a four-way fight with the Spartans. In the middle of all this, Ryan gets hit. With the Needler. Yeah, but she's saved with a blur. Well, she's saved by uh, the Spartan first, and then... And then Guilty Spark jumps in. Uh, you're forgetting about the amazing moment where she fights dirty against the Spartan and kicks him in the balls, and nothing happens. Yeah, his face gets really, his face gets really red, and then he just continues to fight her. I love the brief moment in pause, and where where she's like, he took it like a Spartan, <laughs> as if like you know, yeah, he registers the hurt and I think embarrassment more so than anything else. Well, he wasn't expecting her to fight dirty. Yeah, it was funny. Can confirm Spartan testicles tougher than regular testicles. <laughs> They're like steel balls. I'd imagine Spartans were a cup anyway. They they probably take precautions. Well, when they're in their Mjolnir. They mention that fact that even outside of his armor that he's not invincible, so she goes to the weak point. Per Novak. He's a good guy. Yeah. So the crew end up escaping, but it's a little bit of a close call. Closer than they'd like. And then they take the ace to Earth. Well, there's some great chase scenes on this planet. I think we spend a little more time on this planet. This planet is cool. There's the chase scene where Nico and Lesser are running from some of the bounty hunters and they're going across like a bridge. And yeah. Lessa, like at one point, plays the like innocent little girl thing to some guys. Like, these, these guys are chasing me and they're trying to get me. Oh, I love that. The kid guy are trying to eat me. They're trying to eat me. And it's just like, these guys are like, well, who's trying to eat you? They're trying to sell me and eat me. And then they like pass her back and you get the impression that she uses this gang against the other gang of of um, kid guy, which was kind of cool. And there was like that big moment like throughout the book of Nico and Lessa kind of fighting with each other over like really getting bitter as kind of siblings can be over the fact the stuff that they lost that Nico wasn't really appreciative of everything Lessa had to do in order to like look after him and stuff. So there's a big moment on the bridge where they apologize to each other and all that kind of stuff. So that was I thought that was very well done. I loved their story arc with the two kids. So that was great. They take Kid's death very badly. He's like the closest thing they had to a dad in their life. And yeah. I think Lessa says it at one point in the book, like she never expected to have to confront either uh, Ryan or Kid's mortality anytime soon. They never even thought about it. And then Kid dies and throws everything off. So yeah, they like they make up for everything eventually. And then uh, Ryan says she's rescued by Guilty Spark, who can remote control. The Ace of Spades now everywhere. He's like he's like the ultimate ship device at this stage. Yeah, he is. He's like an extension of the ship. Also, he's also built an avatar so he doesn't have to roam the ship in uh, armature form anymore as well. And he ironically just builds a more pleasant version of his armature as his avatar. Because he considers yeah. little tiny Chaka's avatar and then decides that's not him anymore. Yeah, he decides he's not quite human, but he's not quite AI. I love the fact that um, Lessa puts the Ace of Spades on his shoulder pad, so like it's if, like he's part of the crew. And I do think it's a good moment where he takes the three four three, what it is or what it, the monitor or what he looked like, and he incorporates some of that into his chest to kind of always remind him himself of the monster he can be. I thought that was an awesome moment that he like 
registers the fact that at 343 at the monitor, he was a monster. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't I don't good. think Master Chief's going to be too forgiving of that if he ever meets him again. <laughs> when you mentioned this guy killed Johnson, it's what we all have to think about. As much as this story is a great story of Spark creation, you have to remember, this guy killed Johnson, everybody. And now he has a body that Master Chief can punch. No! He can punch the life out of him. Have you guys learned nothing from this book? It's a redemption story. He's going to have to do an awful lot of redemption with Master Chief. That's all I'm saying. Oh, he's probably not going to appear in the games again, I wouldn't think. Guilty Spark seems like the sort of character you can bring back. It's just going to be really hard to explain how Guilty Spark comes back to the games in a body. Guilty Spark versus Cortana. That's all I'm saying. Halo 6 is how it's going to end. Ooh. Big robot fight scene. Yeah, weird, creepy, real-life Cortana versus robot Guilty Spark. And then Guilty Spark can be like, I was human once and you were never human. You're the monster. And then Cortana's like, you killed Johnson. And then it's like, bum, bum, bum. And then the credits roll. We'll maybe work on this a little bit more, will we? <laughs> yeah, maybe but a little bit. But it'll be a bit, fantastic we'll... fan fiction. But anyway, back to the actual fiction. The Ace of Spades leaves uh, leaves the planet and they then go to Earth because they now have to fulfill the part of the deal with uh, Guilty Spark. And Guilty Spark is still mulling over whether or not he's going to fuck over the crew because he hasn't yeah. completely <laughs> yeah. decided. Also, Guilty Spark knows what happened to Sergeant Forge and he has... The whole time. He has done this thing. Remember when we talked about this on the... Uh, Battleborn audiobook or the Battleborn book club about how you keep a secret from some people and eventually it's too late to tell them and you feel like you can't tell them now Guilty Spark has one of these moments where he figured out reasonably quickly it, he didn't put two and two together immediately but as soon as they hit the debris field he figures out that Forge blew up Etrin Harbridge and therefore Forge is dead but he doesn't tell Ryan this because at this stage he's known for a while and it's going to make things awkward and it's going to upset her. So he like hangs on to it. Yeah, also they've made a deal of he has to help her find her father and then she'll do what he wants. Yeah. So he's like, well, I can't tell her her father's dead because then I won't get what I want. So that's kind of part of it too. He's got all this like inner turmoil going on the whole time. You might even call it guilt. Oh, oh. shit. <laughs> so he... Takes the crew back to Earth. They use their new super duper forerunner systems to land on Earth unnoticed by everyone. So they now have a forerunner cloaking device. So they land on they land outside Mount Kilimanjaro. Yeah, just I forgot to mention it. Right before this, when they're making the deal with Oni on the other planet, that's when Halo Four takes place. Yes. And when the um, Diodact gets to Earth and shoots off the composer against the uh, New Phoenix. So that has just happened. So that's why she's mentioning the fact that this will probably go down well because they've heard of the new Phoenix incident that's pulled away a lot of the UNSC forces. Um, so they reckon. So that's a kind of cool, but that just sets the setting essentially of when this takes place. Which is nice. It's nice to have stuff like that just kind of paralleling what's going on in the games just to kind of get a frame of reference. Yeah, because like we said, there are so many references in this. And when you know the extra lore, you can put all those connections together. Like, even now, I'm still forgetting and remembering stuff as we go along here. They Basically, anyway, they land on Earth without anyone noticing, and they go on a bit of a trek through the plains of Africa, but not before uh, Ram has a bit of a spiritual moment. Because him and Ryan talk yeah. at one stage about, you know, like, would you like to go to Earth? And he says, I think all of us want to go to Earth. And she's like, I never took you as the pilgrimage type. And it was like, and then they have this, I think they recite this, like, Outer Planets folk song together about basically how we all want to go back to Earth at some day. Lissa and Nico haven't gone to Earth either, so they're all very uh, taken back by being on Earth. Ryan's the only person that ever spent any time on Earth. Yeah, they all haven't seen it. She grew up on Earth for the most part. And there was a funny, there's a funny scene where Nico's like looking around and he just grabs a thing, like a handful of dirt and like puts it in his pocket. That's Ram. Ram. Did Ram? That. Was it Ram? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Some, is it Guilty Sparks observing him and he talks about how people like do strange things in moments of like spiritual awakening. And then he talks yeah. about how he like picks up the dirt and I think he smells the dirt as well. 
Yeah, he does. And then Spark talks to him about how it hasn't really changed too much. I'm like, it's been 100,000 years, dude. It has to have changed a bit. <laughs> just, I find it hard to believe bit. Mount Kilimanjaro was there 100,000 years ago and it's still there now. Well, Aaron, we learn a lot more about those I mountains real soon. Say, there could be a reason for that. So they go and they go on a bit of a trek and they go to a cave and first they find they find like ancient cave paintings in the cave. Yeah. Like caveman paintings, kind of. And they trek their way back down through it until they find suspicious forerunner glyphs on a like stone door in the wall that opens up to reveal... Uh, what are we going to describe this? Forerunner sanctum? Yeah, it's, it's like a weird forerunner facility. Yeah, so as they're going in here and entering this facility, I think Spark explains to them on the way in that... When the librarian returned to Earth, she took, I think, does he call them sentinels? But they must be like retriever sentinels, are they? They're not. He calls them retriever sentinels, yeah. But they're, they're obviously big sentinels because this whole, like, tomb is built from one sentinel. There's two yep. others. Yeah, I think it was the ones that they took back that the librarian uses to bury the portal generator in Africa. So I assume they're retrievers. They like bury the terminal or they bury the portal and do that stuff, and then one of them reassembles and reconfigures itself into this room in the mountain. And in the middle of this room, there is a pillar of light. I'm assuming this is something similar to the like device with the light out of a uh, Spartan Ops. That's what I was picturing. Because in that, there's a similar device, and then Halsey steps into it, and she has a interaction with the librarian. And in this one, Guilty Spark enters the light, and he has an interaction with the librarian, because apparently the librarian is everywhere. Well, right before that, there's a big moment where the team is, like, having a wonderful time together exploring this uh, ruins, and they're all, like, really happy for Guilty Spark, for, like, getting here and getting to see what's in front of him, and they're waiting for Ram to act, or to Ryan to activate it. And then all of Oni show up, essentially, and the Apollo team show in. So it's also an important thing to note that while this is happening, it's cutting back to Annabelle in Operation Bookworm, where they've taken the fake Guilty Spark, but it had already, when they had taken it from Ryan and scanned it, it had already beamed itself back to this facility and had pretty much taken over. Yeah, he got on to the Prowler. He got on to the communications equipment on the Oni team, and then he got into yeah. the Prowler systems, and uh, the AI on the Prowler couldn't decode the video of who saved Ryan. It was a blur, so they send the video back to the facility, and then the AI there in Bookworm figures it out straight away, and is like, oh no, like this was easy to decode and fix, and then suddenly... Annabelle realizes we fucked up and then the facility she tries to like do a quick shutdown of everything but it still doesn't work in time and Guilty Sparks like Shard has pillaged the system for information and things he was looking for. Yeah he locks it down locks everyone in. Also another thing is right before Guilty Spark enters the pillar to talk to the librarian <laughs> he stops he stops Ryan for a second and he's just like your dad's dead I've known all this time yeah, I've known all this time. Your dad's de dead. And then there's a fight between them. Ryan, Ryan's kind of fighting Guilty Spark, but... She hits him a bit. Yeah, she hits him. He turns red with anger. He kind of tells her off. He's like, you have no idea what pain is. I watched the entire universe die. She says to him, you don't know what it feels like you know, to lose somebody because she's just lost her dad and she's obviously highly strung up and then he loses the plot and goes crazy red AI because you know when AIs go red, they're the bad guys. And then he face lasers her, just mm -hmm. like Johnson. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. I was, for a minute, I was like, God, I really missed that part of that book. When did that happen? Like, face laser? You had, you had me completely fooled there for a second. Yeah, so in, like, it cuts back and forth then. You've got Guilty Spark steps into the light and he's having his like conversation with the librarian as it's slow motion cuts to outside the light where Ryan and the team are trying to hold off the Oni team. It's, yeah, it's important to note that him stepping in and leaving them behind was a betrayal. Yeah, he says, bye guys. Yeah. Yeah, and just leaves. And then the librarian says some stuff. 
that might be important. Yeah, there's two scenes happening at the same time where, like, Oni is trying to get across the chasm. There's, like, a light bridge that uh, the guys have deactivated to keep them apart. So Oni are on one side with the Spartans. And the team is on the other side. And they're kind of scrambling, trying to figure out what to do, but there's no way out. And then while that's happening, 343 is having a conversation with the librarian. Right. The gist of the conversation between 343 and the librarian is you can't really go back. You can't have what you're missing. Your friends are like gone and at rest in the domain. And you can come with me to the absolute record. Or you can stay here with your new friends. She kind of also says, like, you know, you you have a greater purpose to serve with the humans. You are you can be a guider from the hu- for the humans to the domain. And yeah, he kind of tells her off a little bit, which I liked in terms of like just using people like tools. That I'm just a tool for you. And she says, like, you're nothing that we made. You're something completely new and unique. Do you know what I mean? Which I kind of thought was cool. Well, it's kind of after the events. Like, she uses him during the Forerunner books, but after this, she has... This is not part of her plan at all. Yeah, she kind of says, like, you're you're writing your own script now. Like, this isn't anything I envisaged. So she wants to get to the Absolute Record, essentially, because she needs to prepare it for the humans to take the mantle and to essentially be... What are they? Is it the monitors of the domain or the caretakers of the domain? She also kind of, she also kind of says, you know, the Forerunners were never supposed to have the mantle it was always supposed to be humanity you know you can you can be the guides to humanity or something like that because you're special it's basically like you know you're a special being you can do a lot of good in the world and you because basically it's it's um it's a choice between going to the afterlife for him and you know staying and continuing on and like guilty spark observes what's going on outside and basically decides to go back to ryan and help ryan we forgot the box. Oh, I was going to get to that. I was just going to say, Guilty okay. Spark realizes <laughs> the true meaning of friendship is his friends. Basically, yeah. Uh, he also thinks about, you know, he. this is the point where he finally kind of lets his old friends rest in peace and then realizes, you know, I've made new friends and friendship is great. Before he goes, as is the librarian's way, she gives him something because she gave Halsey a key as well. We were talking about this before the show started. She gives him a key, and uh, I think you have it here in the notes. A key for for what is missing, fix the path, write what my kind has turned wrong. Which is the mantle? And I believe we had mentioned that this key is for something called... Bastion. Bastion is what we thought, maybe. Maybe Bastion. Which is mentioned in Halo 5? It's mentioned with literally no context, either. In in this book in particular, there's no context to it. And the only context you can get for it is in Halo 5 on the Genesis level. That involves a story about a, a builder, a forerunner, trying to find Bastion. That story basically ends with he manages to confirm it still exists, even though he can't find it. And it's what, a, just a mobile shield world? Something like that. It, a she, something that can move... I think the only description it had was something that can move through slip space E without the issues of reconciliation. Without like the problems that the Halos have when they go through. Yes. When it was shut down and when slip space wouldn't work, they'd, this Bastion wouldn't have these problems. So, who knows? It's very vague. This... This entire, like, if you have the novel or even if you have the ebook, mark this chapter because a lot of this stuff will probably make sense in the coming years. Yeah, so mark it, memorize it, whatever you need to do. But I've, this conversation is going to become very relevant in the next coming years, I'm betting. Yep. So, Guilty Spark comes out of the light. He goes to save his friends. Uh,. The light and the canister within the light shoots off through the top of the mountain. It blasts in off rainbows. and takes... In rainbows. Yes, it takes out. Well, also, all of the crew kind of feel something when that happens as well. They all see the, see the librarian. So they do that. Guilty Spark goes red. Guilty Spark shoots at the roof to, like, drop debris in the way of the other team. And then he teleports them out of the cave on a conveniently placed floor teleport nobody realized was there until the last minute it was where the pillar of light was once the pillar of light dissipated it was the uh the portal thing how very ghost of onyx it is it's very ghost of onyx never thought of that they're then out of the mountain and ryan's like well we'll be caught soon this place is going to be like crawling with oni and unsc 
And Guilty Spark's like, no, it's fine. I've remote controlled the ship. It's on its way here. And Guilty Spark continues to demonstrate his usefulness time and time again. Very useful. He is MVP. He is. So they get back on the ship, but they don't leave Earth yet. They go and have like a they have a funeral, basically, for everyone that was lost. Yes. Yeah, it's a cool moment. Yeah, this is for basically Kid and John Forge and Guilty Spark's friends who he's now like put at rest. They have like a bonding moment and this is basically where everyone comes around to each other. Yeah, there's also uh, I think Kazreen got shot again. Yeah, uh, she in, did. There was a brief kind of firefight when um, Guilty Spark came back and fought with the Spartans and stuff. But um, so she kind of wakes up in the ship, and there's a moment where Guilty Spark tells her like how I knew that John Ford had died is because I had all these other connections and data points and all this information. So the Spirit of Fire had been dropping information packets and beaming uh, them back as kind of like breadcrumbs for yeah. people to find, but nobody found them. Um, but they were obviously, I think, must have been in Eden Harbridge or something, the catalogue there, or, or something. The AI there was picking them up because Guilty Spark had them. So she was able to give Ryan the last message that uh, Forge recorded, and he, he had arranged to have it beamed out uh, after his death, or after some time period of time had gone past, so that she didn't get the message too early. It was so sad. Oh my god, that was so sad. Because it's literally him. It's him... On the br- it's him on the bridge after he kills the Arbiter, right? And is about to go up into, like, the beam of light or whatever. I think so, that yeah. That takes him to the center. So it, he literally, literally records it, like, seconds before he's about to die. I thought it was on, uh, I thought it was, like, on the Forerunner ship as he flew to the sun, like he's on his way to the very end. Maybe it's that, but I remember there was, like, a bridge. Well, they're on the bridge. I think the bridge is the platform between, you know, those ships that, like, hover out? I assume that's where it was, and that's what they load the the core into. They load it into a ship, and then he flies to the sun, and that's what gave them time to escape, because uh, okay. Forge talks to the Spirit of Fire a couple of times during the last mission, before the sun blows up. Yeah. He, like, he's en route, and he talks to them a few times during the... Because there's, like... That last mission's timed. It's not infinite. You've got like 15 minutes to finish it and I get out. I hate that mission, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so I assume this happens like during that time. He records this sad message and then she gets it. They have their funeral. They have this. And then they decide that Ryan decides the thing to do is to keep looking for the Spirit of Fire. Because even though her dad's dead, the ship is still out there somewhere. And... They've got the best opportunity now to find it. Well, they kind of lay everything out kind of quite nice where they have like this Uber, the most advanced ship pretty much going right now. They have all this salvage from Trinial, so they have enough money for anything that they could ever really want. They have like a shitty situation in terms of their bounty and Gek are still on the go. And Oni's like really, really looking for them. Oni's going to be really pissed off at them and the UNSC by extension. So they're like, okay, what are we going to do? And they make a comment to like uh, salvaging loses a lot of its slack luster when it's easy. So like when they have this treasure trove of a planet that they can go back to anytime they want and get forerunner tech. So um they kinda like, okay, well we do we'll go find the Spirit of Fire. Which is weird because we know what happens to the Spirit of Fire. So now we are getting very close date wise, because I think it's a roughly now December twenty five fifty seven. So we're getting pretty close to um when the Spirit of Fire comes back into Halo, yeah, Halo Wars 2. And we know that they haven't found them yet because they didn't show up in Halo Wars 2. No, so it'd be interesting to see if maybe they give us the answers of how the Spirit of Fire got to the Ark. That would be nice. Yeah, that would be very or, nice. Or uh, since we know, like, from spoilers of Halo Wars 2, that, like, Anders gets, like, beamed, taken off the Ark and sent away, maybe Rian picks that her up? She's stuck on a Halo, isn't she? They have the super race of spades now. They can do what they like. Yeah, yeah. And I'd imagine they're some of the only people that can, like, resist Cortana's created, like, galaxy shutdown. That's what's going to be interesting because they're very rapidly running out of time to tell stories in yeah. this window because um, we're getting close to, like, the created, um, the ascension of the created, essentially. The way they're going that the ace of spades is now immune to such things because it's basically a forerunner ship. It's true, but I imagine right now we probably have an AI that's 
equal of Cortana in the form of Spark. Yes. So we have so we have something that is not necessarily immune, but he's not going to side with Cortana over anything, I imagine. If he has his team of friends now, he'll be like, fuck you, bitch. Yeah. This book really sets sets up the ace to be super powerful. Like, please nerf the ace's crew. They got a lot of stuff going on. They're probably one of the most powerful crews right now. The Sins of the Prophets guys are probably currently working out how to put the ace of spades into the game without breaking everything because it's suddenly now probably a better ship than the Infinity. It might yes. not be more powerful than the Infinity, but it's definitely a faster, better ship. Man, you got that uber stealth. And you got, like, the fast ability to, like, slip space faster and probably more accurate than anyone else. You have, like, huge potential there for this ship. Hang on. We're going to we're gonna wrap up this last bit of story because we're starting to go long. And then we will do final Ooh. thoughts. So this book basically okay. wraps up with uh, the Turricado goes back to Onyx because it, it was operated out of Onyx. And it was only borrowed by Oni. Uh, well, it was an Oni ship, but it was borrowed for this job. Uh, Team Apollo go to the Infinity, and that's where we get them in the uh, loot crates. And Project Bookworm carries on as before. Uh, they're exploring catalogue and other information, and now they've got the Forerunner facility in the mountain to study. So that's where this book wraps up. It wraps up really fast. Like, right after the library stuff, it's basically over. Yeah, like it's it's short and sweet and to the point. So I'd imagine we will get a third one. That seems likely. We kind of we have lots of trivia through this, but uh, because this book is so new and so fresh, we currently have no trivia on Halopedia to talk about. So, but I think we've done a pretty good job of Easter eggs and trivia. Well, just with the everything it connects and everything it touches on, I think it's the most connected Halo book we've ever had. I was about to say that it's one of the yeah the a book like this that can bring in stuff from Craig Bear's trilogy and make it like super relevant. I mean, that thread was always there and we talked about it numerous times of what they would do with it, if anything. We thought it would like, be very difficult to go back. Just did an amazing job of bringing these new characters in to this old story and making them new again and fresh. I think it's amazing. So, overall, uh, thoughts we'll go to David first. How did you, what do you think overall? Like, do you like this book a lot, a little? Love the I love the vibe since this first book came back. I mean, the crew now and the Ace of Spades, they're in like they're totally over leveled for like um the Halo universe now, so I don't know what they're gonna do. But um I'm very intrigued. I love the characters, I think they're great. Um this character arc of bringing three four three back into kind of redemption story, I think is amazing. Um Kristen must be losing her goddamn mind. I lost my goddamn mind, yeah. It has it's such a sad story for like everything that happens in it. Um there's so much sadness there, but I love it. I love the new characters, I loved all the connections were mental, my brain was going overload trying to remember all this stuff when I saw a name or a place, I'm like, that's from something. Oh my god, what is it? It was it was a it was a whirlwind ride to read this book as fast as I did. Um, with the amount of stuff content that's in it. So, love this book. Highly recommend it. Krista, I assume similar feelings? Thank you for bringing back Guilty Spark. I'm so happy. He got a sexy body now, Krista. Oh, he's got a very sexy body. <laughs> I think that this story definitely touches on a crazy amount of things. And I think this is almost a love letter to, you know, the fans like us who are reading every book, who are really into the deep lore. This is a book written for us, which is really, really nice. Uh, compared to Battleborn, which was written to new fans, it was nice to get something to for the um, for the older fans who have been here for a long, long time. So it is, if you have not read it and you've listened to this, I'm sorry, but you have to read it. Yes, please go immediately. You will enjoy it. Yeah, stop what you're doing and read the entire thing. All right. Um, I think that'll do us then, like, this is definitely, it's a very good book. I can't really find many faults with it either. It, uh, we've been on a very good record lately of good books. I like this. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a good string. We're on a good streak even. Hopefully we get a follow-up to this. I look forward to seeing where on earth they go with a third installment of this, but seeing as trilogy seem to be all the rage with uh, 343 at the minute, I'm, uh, I'm hoping we get another one to round it up. Well, ideally, we'll get we should get another book and another novella because we need two novellas to make a novel. So three four three can't skimp on us. All right. Well, I think that'll do us for this week. This is a nice long episode. 
Um, if you have any thoughts, you can head over to the website and find all of our usual social media haunts to come and get us. Uh, Discord, there are spoiler chats there, or you can join us in the Facebook group as well. And you can find all of our other details there, our emails, our Instagram, our Twitters, our Xbox Live, and get all of us. Uh, you can also shout at Oren, who is unable to read this book because he's working. <laughs> Go and give him abuse for being a productive member of society instead of reading this. Yeah, exactly. I think that'll do us for this one. Evolved? Evolved! Evolved! Evolved.